Hello, my name is Elisa Berlin for Nevada Humanities. On behalf of the organization, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. For those of you who don't know us, Nevada Humanities is the state's independent nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. We are committed to this mission, even in these unsocial times. Before I introduce today's event, I want to acknowledge where I sit today in Nevada. We gather on the traditional land of the Northern Paiute, the Southern Paiute, the Western Shoshone, and the Washoe people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Wherever you may be watching this event, you are on Indigenous land. It is up to you to learn, learn whose land we live on. Uh, we have a link in the chat to help you with this. By respecting our purpose for gathering today, it is also important to acknowledge the Black ancestors who were taken from their homeland and brought here involuntarily, now having built this nation as we know it. As we move through time, our aim is to respect those before us and conserve and preserve for those who are yet to come. This evening's event is part of a series of statewide conversations we have been hosting throughout 2021 around the theme of civic and electoral participation entitled Why It Matters. <clears throat> These events have been introducing us to the challenges faced by new voters, native voting rights, the history of voting in this state and nation, among other topics. You can find the links to past events on nevadahumanities.org. Today we'll be, um, we'll be talking about re-enfranchising people whose right to vote was rescinded. And please tell us what you think. There will be a survey that pops up throughout the talk and you can also reach us at nevadahumanities.org. Let's continue these conversations. I would like to introduce you to our moderator. Todd Belt is a teaching associate professor in the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno where he teaches media writing and public relations. He is a former and longtime board member of Nevada Humanities, and he also serves on the board of directors for the Northern Nevada Hopes here in Reno. Welcome, Todd. Thank you, Elisa. Again, I'm Dr. Todd Feltz of the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno. Welcome to Why It Matters, Restoring Voting Rights in Nevada. Events like these are produced by Nevada Humanities and made possible by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This is our fifth Why It Matters conversation, and I have enjoyed personally learning so much about Nevada and its voting rights. I suspect why it matters will continue on and tackle tough issues. I'm especially aware of conversations that are happening across the nation about the voting rights, as well as actions recently in Georgia that many believe will disenfranchise voters. We've also seen conversations recently, specifically during last year's presidential election, about the rights of formerly incarcerated individuals. We'll be talking specifically about what is being discussed in Nevada. Feel free to chat questions tonight, and I will do my very best to ask these questions of our panelists. Um, I'm sure you enjoy today's conversations and hearing personal stories of people fighting to uplift and advance people and communities directly in, uh, impacted by these voting rights. Now I'd like to really quickly introduce our distinguished group this evening. First, um, Jagato Chambers as a student athlete and during spring break vacation in his senior year of college, Changer, Chambers was charged and later convicted of a violent felony, which led to a nearly six year sentence in the Florida Department of Corrections. Chambers walked away from a career as a sports journalist to travel as a motivational speaker, warning college students 
of the dangers of spring break and visiting the prison systems, promoting a positive release into society. Chris Giungiliani served in the Nevada Assembly for 16 years and as a Clark County Commissioner for 13. As a legislator, um, Chris G champion restoration of ex-felon rights, defelonization of marijuana, compassionate release from prisons, and eliminating the death penalty. Since retiring, she has been involved by serving with the Coalition to End the Death Penalty, the Southern Nevada Immigration Coalition, and many, many other nonprofits. Greta de Jong is a prof foundation professor of history at the University of Nevada, Reno. Her research focuses on the connections between race and class and the ways that African Americans have fought for economic justice, as well as political rights from the end of the reconstruction through the 21st century. Her most recent book is You Can't Eat Freedom, Southerners and Social Justice After the Civil Rights Movement. Greta joins us from her home in Reno. Leslie Ann Turner is the Justice Director heading the Mass Liberation Project and the Vegas Freedom Fund out of the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. She is a 2019 cohort member of Law for Black Lives Fellowship, and Turner has received the Advocate of the Year from the ACLU of Nevada and the Rising Progressive Star Award from Battleborn Progress in 2020. She has been recognized for her work by the City of Las Vegas, as well as from the state of Nevada. Leslie joins us today from Las Vegas. So again, thank you all so very much for being with us today to talk about this important issue. Um, I'd like to kind of start off our conversation um, with um, Dr. De Jong, who will um, give us kind of a little bit of a history on what are some of the tactics that have been used by states and other groups to disenfranchise voters um, in the United States? Yeah, uh, thank you, Todd, and thank you to Nevada Humanities for including me on this panel. Um, so in the colonial era and kind of like the early history of the US, it was common to uh, disfranchise people through property requirements where you had to own a certain amount of wealth in order to vote. Certain groups like women and enslaved people, African-Americans and people convicted of certain crimes were also often denied voting rights during that era. And then after the end of slavery, um, and during the Reconstruction era, when it was possible for African American men uh, to vote, uh, people disfranchised them through violence and intimidation to kind of drive them out of politics. Um, and also fraud was used to um, discourage voting by African Americans and also other supporters of the Republican Party during that period. Uh, and that, that allowed white Southern Democrats who were the party of white supremacy at that time to regain power in the South. And um, so after reconstruction, uh, around the turn of the century, kind of late 19th, early 20th century, there was a spate of changes in the voting laws in the, in the South and also some other states as well, um, where a lot of just obstacles to voting were introduced like literacy tests, poll taxes, really complex registration requirements. And then very importantly, a lot of states expanded the list of crimes that counted as disfranchising crimes, like counted as felonies and really serious crimes that people lost their voting rights for. So things like petty theft, adultery, vagrancy became crimes that could land people in prison and end with um, them losing their voting rights. And in a lot of cases in the South, those, those measures were directly targeted at African-Americans. It was this kind of idea that these were crimes that were commonly committed by black people. Um, and they, you know, they, a lot of them were crimes of poverty, you know, stealing food, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> And then throughout the 20th century, 
racial disparities in the criminal justice system meant that black people were much more likely than white people to be surveilled and arrested and convicted and sentenced and imprisoned for crimes. And so that meant that these laws had a really disproportionate effect on African Americans. Uh, and there are other other ways of disfranchising people just generally, uh, you know, in the, in the post civil rights era as well. Um, just, you know, kind of introducing un unnecessary obstacles to voting. We, we still have very complex registration requirements in some states, um, polling places that are under resourced on election day, leading to long lines, those kinds of things. So a lot of people find it, you know, some people with resources and wealth find it very easy to register to vote and to go and vote. And then other people, you know, encounter many more obstacles to voting. Yeah, thank you. And you know, one of the things, um, it's very interesting, I, we've already got a question and it really kind of sets up, I think, a conversation that we really need to have here. Um, and that is your thoughts and, and looking at Chris G's work, um, as a Nevada, the member of the Nevada Assembly, um, your thoughts on currently incarcerated individuals um, not having the right to vote in almost all of the states um, in America. Um, looking back, Chris, on mm -hmm. some of the work that you did, are you surprised that that is still the case um, in America? Surprised, no. Disappointed, yes. Um, if you really look at most criminal law across the United States, it's either related to your race, your poverty, or your sex. And because white males used to control pretty much everything, they made the rules. And so it's not just felon rights, voting rights. There's just so much that's woven through our fabric as far as how we really truly have social justice. You know, in, in, in I don't, 1999, I was going door to door for reelection and I actually met a man around the corner from me and, he, and we were talking. I said, why aren't you registered to vote? And he said, I, I can't register. I would love to. And I said, why can't you? I really was kind of ignorant. And he said, I'm an ex-felon from New York. And he said, and I'm 60, I think he was 62 years old. And he said, I would love, I try to teach my grandchildren about voting and I can't practice it. So that's really was my trigger and my introduction to thinking about restoration of rights. And as I found out, even more ironically, is in New York, his felony would have been a misdemeanor here. So it's the inconsistencies across the United States in, sen in sentencing guidelines in the long run, too. So in tw 2001, 20 years ago, I will take credit, I tried to restore ex-felon rights, got a little bit of a bill passed. I was also looking at sealing records because that was another barrier that we I came across that individuals are barred from getting an occupational license. They were barred from renting certain apartments. There was just, so I was trying to also change the framework for how you can seal your records to make it easier, quicker, and so forth. And I did pass that bill, but it was amended at least three or four times. Um, but I did get it out of the Senate with a unanimous vote with a, a really la terrible last minute, amend minute amendment by Senator Washington, I think at that time, and, and Dennis, who wanted to exclude category A and B felons because of the, 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 the murder clause and so forth. I had to accept that in order to get the bigger policy moving forward. And sometimes you have to do that. So in 2003, I went back and I worked with, um, then at that time, Senator Horsford I worked with me and we were able to do an autom almost automatic voter re or restoration of rights. But again, every session there's needed to be tweaked because you're dealing with political versus policy on how it affects and impacts people's lives, which means how do you build a community if you continually keep people away from being able to, to assimilate back into their, their societies. So there's still work to be done. I commend the 2019 session for doing the automatic, but we still have people that are busted on the day of election. They're sitting in jail. They aren't convicted of anything. 
how do they go vote? Because they're still allowed to. So, I mean, there's just still a lot of things out there that need to be worked on. Yeah, so it appears that there are a lot of barriers and a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of, um, and thank you, Angelina Saldana, for your, for your question. Um, I, I wanted to go to Jageda for just a moment because he kind of represents this group and he tells his story all over America. Um, I just like to ask you, Jageda, to kind of um, um, tell our listeners about the situation that you faced as a young man and kind of how that changed your lens and your perspective on voting rights for the formerly incarcerated in America. Um, thank you, Todd. Um, and thank you, Nevada Humanities for the opportunity. Um, you know, like, like majority of the parents in, in, in this country, you know, I was a college senior, um, had very, very much well onto my way to what, what, what I would deem a productive life and um, you know, my, my parents had to experience that their worst my nightmare. I know they didn't think um, I would go on spring break for five days and end up um, incarcerated, but that was my reality. I actually went with a group of friends, gotten to a physical altercation with a buddy of mine and, and ended up stabbing him four times, nearly taking his life. Um, he initiated the, the uh, instigated the situation. So my naive young 20 year old mind, um, I, I deemed it, I'm not gonna volunteer to go to, to, go to prison. I, I didn't wanna take any plea. They offered me an aggravated battery, it was in Florida. So I went to trial and lost. So my, my reality changed in but a moment. I took finals after bonding out in December and I was in prison in January. So I think my reality, I was sentenced to nearly six years. So I was in prison nearly 2000 days. Um, that, that, that became home, you know? And so the reality of me even having an opportunity to leave prison, um, I, I knew when I left that I, I couldn't participate in, 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 in the voting process and, and I couldn't carry a firearm. They, they were adamant about that in Florida. So I had surrendered that, you know, my father took me to the polls. Both of my parents participated in every election that I can recall. The sticker was always a big deal, but for some reason, I think we know uh, Ms. Dr. DeYoung was phenomenal in, in, in talking about the, the reality of our country. And once you encounter that criminal justice system coming back to participate, they remove that passion from you. Um, so, and, and to me, I feel like it is a step to, to keep um, this system in place as it is. So, you know, the, the legislation in 2019 to take that uh, step to allow people, and, and Nevada is unique, you walk out of um, custody, no matter if you're on supervised release or anything, you can participate. And to me, that's one of the biggest steps in engaging in community and trying to lead your family um, there is no bigger a step in community involvement than, than getting our folks to understand, hey, they have a voice and it matters. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and what an interesting story. And I think that there's a lot of these stories um, all around America and all around Nevada. Um, I know that, uh, Leslie, you, have, you work on a lot of really important issues for Nevada. And I, I'm always interested when people make their life's work um, uh, trying to, to change a, a way of thinking. And I, I mean, I kind of think that's what this is about, like helping people understand that people serve their time and they should be able to reenter society and have all of the privileges that everyone else has. Um, what are some of the challenges as the ju uh, justice director um, as you work with um, heading the Mass Liberation Project. Um, how do you guys approach um, helping people understand what it takes to include people in the voting process? Um, thank you. First of all, just thank you for having me. And I think one of the most important things is uh, making people care about it and understanding that they do have a stake in voting, they do have an they do have a stake in the electoral process, 
And a lot of that <clears throat> uh, kind of like generational disconnection from voting uh, comes from um, trauma. It comes from the history of this country, um, the political violence that was used against, uh, you know, Black people during the Reconstruction era um, in relation to the Black codes. And, you know, there are people who were killed for voting. There were people who were killed for winning their uh, electoral offices. So um, that kind of, that fear trickles down generation after generation. So I think that plays a role. And then there's obviously a huge distrust of government in our communities. And, um, and it's because this is the same government, this is the same institutions and systems that come in and, you know, remove people from our community, you know, disappear them forever, a lot of times kill them. So um, I think kind of weighing all those things, it is, it is difficult to mobilize folks around, even, you know, formerly incarcerated people whose votes are, do matter and their right to vote has been restored. Uh, often it takes a lot of work just convincing them of that and having these deep conversations about history and about kind of what we can do in the future, what we can do as impacted people. Um, I also wanted to just, you know, thank Jagata for sharing his story um, because it is, again, it's trauma <clears throat> and we share our trauma as a, as a way, as a way for us all to learn from it. And it is really important that we're listening to the stories of impacted people. Yeah, um, I agree, uh, Leslie. Um, so events like these, if you're just joining us, are produced by Nevada Humanities and made possible by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm Todd Feltz of the Rental School of Journalism. Uh, joining me today on the panel are activists Jagata Chambers and Leslie Turner, former Clark County Commissioner and Nevada Assemblywoman Chris Giuliani, um, Dr. Greta DeYoung, a foundation professor of history at the University of Nevada, Reno. So um, I thought we would sort of talk about what's happening in Nevada right now for just a moment. Um, you know, we've got conversations going on about the end of the death penalty. Um, we have um, conversations, um, you know, we, we were kind of a, a featured state during the last presidential election. People turned to us um, because of the pandemic. We've had, um, you know, we had a lot of people vote that had not voted um, in the past. Um, so what 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 is it taking for Nevada to and, and one other thing I think it's important to bring up that we have, you know, a, a female majority in our in our Senate and legislature or in our assembly. So in our state legislature, I mean, it seems to me that that our state is open to restoring voting rights um, and 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 also, as Chris G has pointed out, breaking down barriers that um, prevent um, people from voting. Um, and, and as Leslie points out, um, kind of overcoming historical trauma in certain groups that have faced disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement I can't talk, um, around voting rights. So um, I was just curious, um, is there something that you feel like we should um, be talking about right now when it comes to restoring voting rights um, in Nevada. Chris G, if you wanted to start this part, I'd appreciate it. Um, you're muted. It's okay. It happens all the time. Following directions for once. Um, you know, in Nevada, the, the automatic restoration was huge. It's what I tried to do 20 years ago. And it's taken that long a time for that to come into play. But remember, we can only control our own state laws. You have federal ex-felons that are, so you need some federal action that needs to take place from our, our senators and our Congress people to make sure that they, they don't miss that group of individuals that are there. You have to look at economics because so much of our laws were based on if you're poor or not, whether it's your housing, uh, restrictions, you know, where you can live. If you're an ex-felon, you still can't get together with a bunch of other ex-felons. So if Leslie wants to do an organizing meeting, technically they're violating state law. I mean, there's just so many leftover. I used to argue 
they used to not, they still don't give them a true ID when you get out of, out of prison, okay? And I used to argue with the, the P and P and Metro and all the different folks. And they said, well, they might have a different name that they're sentenced under. I said, they just did their time under that name. Then that's the damn name that they should be released with and given an ID for. You can't do anything in this country without an ID, right? So there's other things that trickle down in addition to voting rights. It is the reassimilation. If you want people to become part of their community again, voting is absolutely imperative. It's your civic duty, in my opinion, to do that. And so um, educating the, the general electorate, Leslie's right when saying that you have to convince even felons that it's okay for them to be able to vote, um, to want that how does it do how does it affect them so there's a whole education component that still really does need to come through but we can't forget about every state has a different way of doing it we really need to look at it i think there's only three that you never lost your right to vote even when you were they could vote from prison but that doesn't occur here so here like i mentioned earlier if you're just got a ticket and got hauled off to the jail and it's voting day or early voting and where do you get your ballot from? How do you make sure that they bring it to you in the jail? There are other structural things that need to be taken a look at. Jakeda, are you, were you getting ready yeah, to say something? I actually would love to follow that. Um, some of the efforts that as my, I was the right to hire, blessed by a shout out Emily Zamora. I was hired by Silver State Voices to lead the rights restoration work. Um, I was involved and invested in that legislation in 2019. So for it to evolve to gainful employment for me, that can't be minimized. Um, I, I think one thing that our country has to do is um, the hurdles that need to be cleared to have a formerly incarcerated base invested in the um, political scheme of things. There's so much education that has to come and it needs to be done by a directly impacted person. Um, that conversation is a tough, uh, gristle-filled conversation that needs to be happened through the lens and eyes of someone who's directly impacted. So I would hope that our country would mirror the efforts um, that took place here in Nevada. And then secondly, um, just res uh, restoring the citizenship in its entirety. Voting is a humongous step and a key component, but we can't um, fool ourselves into believing that a person is now a citizen now because he can vote. Um, there is a trail of um, hurdles that come with becoming formally incarcerated. So we have to use this as um, almost a rake to get the ground fertile to, to restore whole citizenship for folks who come in contact with the criminal justice system. And I think voting is a key component and, and more than likely the very first step in having that formerly incarcerated base even begin to believe. Um, Leslie? Um, I just wanted to add that uh, some of the things I think that we, we have to start talking about uh, for people getting out of prison in, in particular is just resources and, um, you know, but we've been doing what the Vegas Freedom Fund is we've actually been giving cash grants to folks getting out of prison just to help them get their footing, help them get on their feet. And we need um, a safety net like that for folks coming out of prison because they're literally getting out with nothing. Um, and then we also as a state have to really start thinking about decarceration, which just means lessening the amount, the amount of people in prison. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. It can be done by changing laws. It can be done by investing in communities on the front end um, so that we can reach a point where we're, we can stop perpetually responding to harm. Like when the police come and they're responding and then you know they're, they're arresting folks, when they're sending people through the criminal justice system and convicting them and sending them to prison, that isn't, that nothing's been prevented from happening there. There's nothing that we can do there for future generations. So that's what we have to start really thinking about is how do we just stop responding and start actually preventing these things from happening in the first place. Um, the other thing briefly I just wanted to say was that uh, we have to pay attention to what's happening at the legislature. 
um, you know, AB 116, decriminalizing traffic offenses, AB 151, uh, stopping the suspension of driver's license for, for inability to pay. And like we already mentioned, AB 395, which is uh, ending the death penalty. And I think these are steps where we can start undoing systemic racism. You know, the state, there was a declaration during a special session last year where it's like, you know, uh, systemic racism is a public health threat. Yes, it is. So as we're undoing that, um, we have to also address the harm that's been caused already. And I, I think we have to start looking at actually incentivizing decriminalization, meaning if we look at, for instance, the 94 crime bill, which was obviously federal legislation, um, you know, that bill was so pervasive across the country because it incentivized making stricter laws, incentivize doing things like three strikes, mandatory minimums, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So states got money for doing that. So the same way they got money for making stricter laws that put more black and brown people in cages, we need to incentivize and we need to give states money to decarcerate, to actually fix these systems and invest in communities that have been harmed. Um, you know, what I do is abolition organizing. So in abolition, you know, everyone gets freaked out by that. Um, and we're like, oh my God, you know, we can't live without police. And it's, it's less about that. And it's more about as we're dismantling these systems that have caused harm over time, what are we building to replace them? How are we changing and shifting society as a whole so that one, we can find new ways to address harm other than the carceral system, which is the only thing we've ever been told. And then also how do we stop harming each other as human beings on this planet and um, really get to a point in society where, you know, our kids, kids, kids um, can live in a world that, you know, prisons and, and policing is obsolete. That should be like the future. So I just wanted to add that. Leslie, can I jump in? This is Chris. Yes. And, you know, as a retired teacher as well, um, talking, let's talk about the youth because that's a whole nother factor that we're not dealing with. I never supported having school police, for example. We are, we begin incarceration way earlier than people realize. We just don't call it as such. And so looking at those punishments that come into play that begin locking up our black and brown kids and mostly males in juvie, in, in opportunity, in, in different places, rather than addressing mental health issues or financial issues. And then just on the side, think of how much money, the school police started out making more money than a first year teacher. Where's your priorities? So those dollars could be reinvested in a de-escalation program. I think every school cop should have to read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Maybe they might mellow out a little bit, um, but there are some things that deal with our youth so that we're not creating a pathway that they see no other way out other than that. Um, the three strikes bill, that was done under a democratic governor. I voted against it and we're still dealing with that. That needs to come off the books. We should not be punishing young people under age 18 for many things that their brain is not finished developing with. I, I got rid of the death, well, I tried to get rid of the death penalty along with Sheila Leslie in 2001 and then in 2003, I got rid of it for 18 year olds and under um, and that was before the federal government, the Supreme Court struck it down. But I used, I had a doctor that came from CDC and he explained how the brain functions and the gray matter and the white matter and judgment that comes here. So, so many laws were probably correctly made for 21 and older because your, your reasoning was not in the play. Not punishment laws, just general, you know, driver's licenses and whatnot. But we really need to take, a, you shouldn't be sentencing them as adults. Uh, we didn't even have a program in place. We were sticking young kids in prison with, you know, criminals of 15 years and 60 and 70 years of age. I had them come to me and say, get them out of here. They don't belong with us. So there are so many other tangential problems that are there that we have to really embrace. The criminalization, we were working on the decriminalization of traffic tickets with Ozzy Fumo, how, what? You, with the so Social Justice Coalition. And here we are still in 2021 and there are people that don't understand that it's a racist piece of legislation if you don't undo that, that you are creating a further destabilization of families. 
there's just so many conversations that have to occur. So thank you for Nevada Humanities for even having this because after session, we still need to continue these conversations so that we're educating people about the barriers. About you know, Jagada, you said you were in Florida. Did you know that Jeb Bush, you had to pass a character test, even if you've completed your crime. And he would ask you things like, Do you drink? What does that have to do with anybody getting off of, of, off of um, probation? It's so there's still a lot of antiquated things out there that we need to deal with. Yeah, um, there is a question, um, um, Dr. Young, we'll come to you in just a moment. I wanted to, there's a question from one of our attendees um, and, and Jagada, Leslie, any of you, do you happen to know the percentage of people who register for the first time out of prison to vote in Nevada or re-register once they get out of prison? And how hard is it to do that? Do either one of you know the difficulties? Leslie might. I know that there was something like 77,000 potential folks that could register after the passage of that bill last session. It's very difficult because again, it's illegal to even get together, okay? So if you wanted to call a group together at the library to talk about how to register to vote, technically they're not supposed to talk to each other. So I, I don't know, Leslie, do you, I know it was probably very, it's hard just to get anybody to register to vote the first time around, let alone someone who feels that they've been hurt by their own government. You know, right. where's their level of trust? I know that um, in, the efforts um, during the last cycle, um, we at Silver State Voices concocted a hotline, 187-431, uh, around the Assembly Bill 431, um, 1901. But anyway, the, the hotline was directly rooted for formerly incarcerated folks to call in. That hotline actually went right to my phone. I talked to uh, more than 100 folks called in um, and the consensus of all of the majority, 85% of them didn't want to be um, notified or didn't want it to be known that they had been formally incarcerated. They wanted to be secretive. They wanted to just get the information from me. Um, hey, how do I do it? Can I do it? So that definitely relayed to me the pulse of the majority of the formerly incarcerated people. They they didn't want nothing to do with that whole process. And those who did, um, it was under the efforts, shout out Leslie, shout out all the good folks that plan, um, Vegas Don, we, a, a, a conglomerate of effort of everybody that we came in contact with our community, um, there was an education component that had to happen within a conversation. So for instance, it wasn't, um, it was almost blasphemous or disrespectful for Malians to come up talking to our people, talking about, hey, you want to register to vote. There's a, a laundry list of questions that we have to get through to show compassion, concern, and being real versus just say, hey, you want to register to vote? Um, so we went with a realistic approach, try to shower our community with love, open up spaces, like Ms. G said. Um, for, I had formerly incarcerated folks who had spent over 10 years in Nevada Department of Corrections, had been home three years and had never seen each other free. So we're opening up space where brothers had shared uh, hundreds, thousands of days together on a tier and had never seen each other in the free world because nobody would jeopardize their freedom trying to meet up, talking about this. So when I opened up that space, um, that was, was the most telling of anything, um, there's a, a hurdle that we have to get, o, get over with it, including our folks. Again, this is a, a disenfranchised, say they were, you're not a citizen. Like, let's talk about the real, it's not disenfranchised. You're, you're introducing this to a facet of people who have never been on the radar of a, a political scheme. Yeah. I'm, Greta, could I add something? Yeah, of course, Leslie. It'll be really fast. Um, just two things. One is that I think like historically this country uh, will attempt to legislate, do a legislative fix of a problem. And then it's just, they're done with it. I mean, that's how it was with emancipation. Like, okay, everyone's free now, but okay, people have nothing. <laughs> what does that mean? So it's yeah. like, you're not addressing the, the consequences of that law. So, and we saw the same thing with AB 431. There was 
very few resources. I mean, money had to be raised in the nonprofit sector. There was a very few dollars from the state, if any, put into actually getting out there and finding the people who were impacted by this, by people who should never have been disenfranchised in the first place. So that's the other thing. That's one thing is like investing in actually reaching out to formerly incarcerated people and getting them the political education and the information they need to register to vote. On the other side of that, we got out in the community and we're talking to our folks. We're talking to formerly incarcerated people. That's the majority of the mass liberation base. And you know, they didn't believe us. I had to carry the actual bill with me and show it to people, read through it with them. I had to have, I remember one time I had to have uh, uh, Will, William McCarty actually like kind of like co-sign, like tell him like, yes, this is real because um, people have been so, you know, disenfranchised and dis dis just disregarded by the system and by government. So there's a really, there's a strong lack of trust there and again, it goes, it still is connected to resources. We need resources to be able to, you know, get people registered. Yeah. Um, I, Greta, thank you so much for being patient. We got on a tangent. Um, I know that you have um, something to add. Please add it now, if you would, please. No, no tangent. Um, as you know, just in relation to the conversation about where do we go from here, um, I think there's, you know, there's really broad support among the public for restoring voting rights to people who have completed their sentences and are now out of prison. But as Chris mentioned, and I think Angelina's question related to this as well, that doesn't do anything for the people who are still in prison and cannot vote. And there are millions of them, and there are good reasons for allowing them to vote. Um, first of all, it's a way of humanizing them. You know, the prison is a dehumanizing thing enough already. There's no reason to take people's voting rights away from them while they're in prison. They also have a really valuable perspective to bring to um, inputting, you know, providing input on policy, especially criminal justice, because they are the ones most directly affected by the criminal justice system. And they would have really good insights into how to frame policies around that. The other thing is that those people, um, for the purposes of representation, you know, the population counts that determine representation of communities uh, in Congress, prisoners are counted in the communities where they are imprisoned um, instead of the, the communities where they came from. And that's a way of disempowering their home communities and giving the, the places where prisons are located, which are often in rural white areas, giving those communities much more power and resources than they would otherwise receive. So now I know why everybody wants to have a prison in their community. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. So events like these are produced by Nevada Humanities and made possible by Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm Todd Feltz of the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno. If you're just joining us, uh, we're speaking with um, activists Jagada Chambers and Leslie Turner, former Clark County Commissioner and Nevada Assemblywoman Chris June Gil Chilean Giliani. Gosh, I've said that perfect all the way. Here we go. <laughs> June Kiliani um, and the, uh, Dr. Uh, Greta De Young, a foundation professor of history at the University of Nevada, Reno. So I would like to, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'd kind of like to start looking to the future. So what, what, what work currently is on the table that you believe is the most important work that we could and our listeners and our viewers could think about? Um, we'll get to what they can do, but first um, we'll start with you, Leslie. What are some, what's the most important pressing work around restoring voting rights in Nevada going forward? Um, what do you think? I think the most important thing is just to keep it going. And, and like I said earlier, to make sure that resources are being um, put into, you know, organizations like Silver State Voices, like, you know, funding folks like Jagada who are out here actively trying to find formerly incarcerated people to engage. And then I think it's also important to understand that this is just one part of what needs to happen. Um, 
because we need to be looking at the bigger picture around how we build a, a world that is just. And I, I think it's going to take a kind of like mass refusal of everything we've been taught, every, everything, all the ways in which things have been defined for us, like how justice is defined, how public safety is defined. We have to define it for ourselves. And I think um, that is when we will bring about a world that is actually just and um, that we can you know, feel good about leaving to our kids. Um, I, th I do believe strongly in the abolition of police and prisons. Obviously that does not mean that you know, next month, shut down NDOC and let everyone out. That's not the way that works. Um, it is some, it happens over time. It's a journey. And I think that um, we individually can be taking steps to get there in our day-to-day -day lives just by thinking about different ways to address harm. Even if, even if it's just with your kids, even if it's just parenting, how, when our kids do something they're not supposed to do, how are we addressing that harm that they've caused? How are we addressing those things and how we interact with each other? And eventually over time, we will reach a point where, um, you know, we're not out here killing each other. We're not out here, um, you know, dealing with the amount of violence, which is just like, we're actually desensitized to it because it happens so much. Um, you know, I've watched video of two people being executed this week and it's, it's not okay. This is not the way that this country should be, you know, how we should be living. And, I, and we have to really be, use our imaginations to get to a new place. You know, Leslie is absolutely correct. It, yes. And the death penalty, you know, is a good example of passed out of the assembly, but what's going to happen? We need people engaged, calling their legislators, calling the governor's office saying this bill needs to be signed. This is the year to end racism in Nevada by using the death penalty. It's just another form of, it's a racist act in the long run. Um, but we have other things, so same day registration, automatic registration, um, mail ballots. I think there's a bill on that, the decriminalization of traffic tickets that Leslie mentioned. There's so many pieces that are out there that continually people are having to react to instead of being given opportunities. And I think that's how legislation should really be focused on policy. What's good public policy? So more events like this, conversations with your neighbors, really having people talk about, they don't even know the difference work, you know, what's between the municipal government and the, and the state government. And we do have to do a job, a better job in our schools of educating people about their civil rights, as well as how, how community work, how government works. I got an opportunity to work the election for the first time because I was in office for close to 30 years. So you're not allowed to work the polls. So I, I, I was over at Pearson and it was amazing how many people walked in the door saying, what's a D, what's an R, what is it? <laughs> I mean, just from, I, I get to register to vote. Who, how do I do that? I said, I can't tell you <laughs> who to register for. You know, there was just so much unknown and so much of civics is really conversations with your family, your friends, and your neighbors. And so maybe if we can cultivate that kind of an opportunity where we're sitting down, we don't all have to agree, but you find out how government does impact your life from buying a glass of a, a, a gallon of milk, the taxes that are on it, that's governmentally done. From what you pay for your car to put gas in, that's those taxes are, are, are added none of that. How do you get a street fixed? So having those conversations on civics, but because for years they took a lot of that out of the curriculum, not just in Nevada, across the United States in order to teach to the test, we don't educate our youth in the way that we should. And then our youth can help educate their elders. It's just something that's missing. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and thank you, Anthony Moore, uh, one of our um, uh, viewers for, um, you know, kind of getting us um, kind of into the next phase, the final phase. What's some things that we could be doing to help address these issues? You know, us regular people out here, um, you know, people who have jobs and, and trying to figure out um, a better Nevada the restoration of voting for people who feels like um, they've been disenfranchised. What can we do? 
And I'm going to know who their legislator is, their senator and their assembly person, and at least send them an email saying, I like this, this is stupid, whatever they might think. And then when they come home, you offer to host something at your house. So you make them accountable and you have to see they need to talk your talk, walk your walk, know what your neighborhood looks like, because just running for office doesn't give you a free pass to be a good legislator either. Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. Um, you have to make sure you're registered to vote. And I think people want to get critical and say, oh, see, we, we re-enfranchised them and only 2,000 people registered. Wait a minute. How many of them were even registered before they wound up in prison, for God's sake? Probably a very small minority. Why? Because they're a minority, <laughs> you know, because there's some voter suppression going on like they are in Georgia right now. All of it is interlinked. And so we have to do a better job of making sure that we don't we don't, we have to demystify government, but we have to explain how it affects your life from one second to the next. Um, I, I do want to hop in and say one thing, what I'm doing right now is um, my shirt, the, the, the theme was about uncaging the votes. We were able to do that. Now let's uplift the community and that's only going to happen through legislation, policy and resources. So what I've opened up is spaces for formerly incarcerated folks to uh, watch parties, watch some of these lead sessions. We're in a unique scenario with COVID. You can watch them on replay on YouTube. You can go to Nellis and see the videos. So I'm opening up a space, like you said, it's the education component is gonna carry on for decades, okay? So we have to be serious about that and digging in and that um, is opening up the space, sharing the knowledge that you do having folks get familiar with Nellis, but then not only that, the Nevada Department of Correction can post a sign that says, when you leave prison, you can vote. That's a game changer in itself. Parole and probation can send a note out when they're doing their fees or their uh, urine analysis, and let them know. I had to flyer and uh, bug and vagabond around parole and probation just to come in contact with the mass amount of folks when they could get that in one seal. So when we get the state to really begin to want to involve that population, a lot of education can come from them with one swing of the bat. Yeah. And you can give to organizations like Plan, Mass Liberation, Silver States. There's so many, even if it's a $5 a month, every bit of that compounds and then they're able to solicit grants and find money in other places so vote not only with your feet but also you know share when you got the opportunity it makes a huge or give to nevada humanities think about how much of our organizations that are they have they're on a a women at prayer in order to be able to get the funding to be able to do these types of things so it always takes money in the long run as well as people I second all of that. I think getting involved is super important. And also just like in a general way, from a historical perspective, people need to be constantly vigilant about threats to democracy. I think there's this assumption among, in, you know, in the culture that democracy is so solid in the United States that it will never go away. And it's just a story of progress of expanding voting rights. And that is not historically true. Um, in many periods of US history, we've seen rights expanded and then taken away. And we're in another period right now where rights are being taken away. And if we're not vigilant, you know, we could see the end of democracy in this country. Well, gun laws in the session right now need to be looked at as well. And the, the right for police officers, you know, we still have that whole debate that's going on. All of those make a difference. And so if, if you're not caring so much about voter rights, then at least get involved and make sure that you're following what's going on with regard to your community. And that means policing as well. Um, so there's so much work to be done. But it starts with one person, one question, one action, and, and it makes us more powerful. Um, there's just, you know, we have to fight over background checks and that finally get passed. But, but they haven't undone the law from 2017 when Roberson screwed Nevada, in my opinion, and protected the, the, the public safety officers versus everybody else. And so the legislature controls everything and the local governments can't even say what's best for them in their own neighborhoods. So there's still a lot of work that the legislature has to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's so many things that are resonating today. I mean, you know, as someone who teaches college, I see a lot of opportunities for my students to report 
and to do campaigns around these issues. And um, but I think it's a lot about having the right conversations. And that's what I think is making today important is because we are having a conversation about um, something that really matters um, and how much I've learned in these five why it matters um, series um, about things that honestly I didn't really understand until listening to you guys and others um, talk about it. So we're, we're kind of here at the end. Any last thoughts? I'm just going to kind of go around the, the panel here, starting with Leslie. Um, what is your kind of kicker thought that you'd like to share with our listeners about this vote, you know, restoring the restoration of voting rights here um, in Nevada? Um, that I guess my final thought is just that uh, restoration of voting rights is super important to our community. And it's, you know, it's about, uh, like Jagata mentioned, uh, people who've been historically disenfranchised uh, being given their, their citizenship back that they never should have lost in the first place. And, and, and also I think it's really important to understand history, understand um, the reconstruction era, understand black codes, understand the way that, uh, you know, the intent to create this and maintain, I should say, a racial caste system in this country is, is cloaked with legislation and how we need to undo that but we can't just undo it. We have to also address the harm that's been caused in those communities because healing is justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to get to this, but there is an issue that we're going to table and maybe put in a, nut, a future Why It Matters discussion about the, the uh, power of uh, police unions and organizations and how they might um, impact um, this conversation. Um, Jagata, again, I wanted to just thank you again for sharing your story today. Um, that was much appreciated. Is there any last thoughts that you have about um, this restoration of voting rights? Um, you know, as a formerly incarcerated person and being blessed enough to lead this work in this state, I'm always going to be uh, passionate and em em emphatically petitioning our formerly incarcerated folks to get involved. Our hotline is still alive. Um, hopefully there's some formerly incarcerated folks that might want to take that step. I'm, I'm here to talk. My, my, my time is always available for our folks. And then, and then, you know, secondly, um, when we talk about criminal justice reform in this state, or especially in our region here in Clark County, um, the district attorney has had a stranglehold on this and we roll into a district attorney's race in 2022. So it is a pivotal time for that formerly incarcerated voice to come out, especially as we elect our next district attorney here in Clark County. And again, thank you so much, Todd and Nevada Humanities. Yeah, you're welcome, Jagata. Um, Greta? Yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about contacting our legislators and I just wanted to emphasize to people just to never underestimate the impact of that. As a historian, I've spent a lot of time in archives going through the papers of po political leaders. And when you have a stack of letters from people on one point, that really makes a difference. And I can see the shifts in policy, so. Wow, great point. What a good yeah. point. Uh, and Chris G, yeah, you can <laughs> take us home as we say. In this it's hard to be a legislator. So, you know, I commend all of them for even running for office. That said, um, your day job should not define how you legislate or establish policy. So if you're a DA, get out of my way because you should not be voting on something or stopping something from moving forward because of your day job or a PD for that matter. You should be sharing your expertise, but allowing the process to move for forward. So we really do appreciate um, all of you. Um, Jagata Chambers, uh, Leslie Ann Turner, um, Greta DeYoung, and Chris June Kiliani. Who Perfect. <laughs> um, we really appreciate you so much um, being on the panel this evening. Um, again, events like these are produced by Nevada Humanities and made possible by Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative by our friends at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Thank you all for listening in. Again, I'm Todd Feltz of the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno.
And now I'm going to hand it back over to Elisa Berlin at Nevada Humanities. Um, on behalf of Nevada Humanities, thank you to Todd Feltz, Jagata Chambers, Leslie Ann Turner, Greta DeYoung, and Chris Kill June Kiliani. Uh, please fill out a survey and tell us what you think. And thank you for tuning in. Good night.